Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see that some folks uh, in our industry didn't go to con. So uh, <laughs> no fear of missing out on that at all. I'm joined by the very handsome and debonair uh, council member Dan Skinner as well today um, to Thanks, John. Wonderful. Wow. <laughs> I want to thank Dan also for saying that everyone was going to be in formal wear suits today. I, I could see you all wearing tuxes and gowns today, too, so I'm glad we, we dressed up. Um, thank you, Hope, for that nice introduction. We are very, very pleased to join you here today and talk a little bit about ConAgra Brands and the work that we're doing to modernize our, our company and portfolio. Um, before we get into the specifics, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, what ConAgra Brands is uh, we are a Fortune 500 consumer packaged goods company that has been in existence for nearly a century. Um, as you will see on this chart, today we are not the agricultural business that we started out as or the global conglomerate that we had become. I think we, we could jump back to the other slide, yeah. Um, for the first time in our history, we are a branded pure play company with tremendous focus on, on building our brands and actively listening to our consumers. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, we have about 60 brands in our arsenal, but as we all know that all brands aren't created equally. We have to look at, um, we have to look at where the potential is, where the marketplace is going, and really not only plan, you'll hear me say this a lot today, for our consumers today, but then also our consumers of tomorrow, and not rely just on our core base, but how we're going to expand that. We're an $8 billion business. Um, as you'll see here, we have four operating segments. Our two largest segments are grocery and snacks and refrigerated and frozen. Uh, the primary assets of our business are our brands. Uh, we have a diverse array of iconic brands that, that some you probably do recognize. Um, Hope was talking before about Peter Pan, one of my favorites, um, uh, Snack Pack, which I still love. Um, but we, you'll see uh, many of our brands are a number one or number two in their respective categories. Um, but there's an opportunity for us to grow these categories, and there's an opportunity for us to grow these brands as well. Many of the brands, not all of our brands. As stewards of our brands, it's our responsibility to keep them alive and well. Uh, we have to be strong, they have to be innovative, they have to be relevant and in demand. And how do we do this? Well, we do this by capturing growth and, and, and understanding the ever-changing and evolving needs of our consumers and the landscape, as, as many of you probably saw, of course, the Whole Foods Amazon uh, uh, meal, uh, meal acquisition last week. It is gonna be many meals. Um, next slide, here we go. Things like taste, convenience, variety, wellness, and in increasingly authenticity, or being perceived as real versus processed, are all the attributes that consumers care about today. Um, these are demand drivers that over the years, we had under-leveraged, and we had underinvested in, but we're changing that now. But I, I will tell you, we kind of learned the hard way um, by, you know, the old saying is true. If you ignore your brands, they will go away, and so will your consumers. Um, we, we made a bet on private label several years ago uh, um, uh, that the future of the, the company was going to be in private label business, and, you know, we, we really did not support our brands the way that they deserve to be to be supported. And because of that, the results were, were not strong. So that is why we've got to breathe life and contemporize these brands, which is why we're happy to talk with you today. Uh, as a company, today we are more focused on health and wellness, premium or chef-driven products, and gourmet or ingredient-driven foods than ever before. Um, if you take a look at the eight brands that are up here right now, in the past, we were focused on just selling more products at a lower price, or as we say, volume over va value. Dan and I were talking yesterday. You, to give you an idea of how we were just in it to sell volume, um, one of the brands that's not up here is Banquet. Banquet's a, a, a big frozen uh, meal that we have, a frozen dinner, and frozen meals, I should say. Um, Banquet, up until a year and a half ago, you could buy Banquet for the same the same money you would buy it in 1968. You could buy 10 for a dollar. Uh, you know, and now, to be fair, we did not upgrade the product, we did not upgrade the recipes, we did not upgrade the ingredients, we didn't upgrade the packaging, so there wasn't a ton of a lot of innovation going into it. But can you imagine, uh, you, you know, certainly our homes aren't costing the same as they were in 1968, and, and our, our cars aren't, and, and many other products and brands aren't either. So, so uh, same thing with Hunts. Up until a year ago, you could buy Hunts, a can of Hunts, 
for 70 cents. Um, you know, we sold a lot of cans, but we, we just didn't make any profit. And that was the same price as the 70s. Um, so while we, in, we did do some innovation, but we were undisciplined, we were inefficient, and, and many times our innovation wasn't really steeped in consumer insights. We weren't really actively listening to the consumer, and, and, and certainly not to the extent that we do today, and certainly not to the extent that our competitors do, and our customers expect, and our consumers now expect. So in order for us to be truly successful, innovation must exist throughout all aspects of the brand. Um, on the product itself, like we said before, um, whether it's coming out with new flavors or ingredients or all these brands that you see up here, um, or whether it's done in the way that we tell and sell the story. Um, by leveraging consumer insights, we are modernizing our brands to fit into today and tomorrow's consumers' busy lifestyles. For example, the Power Bowls that you see up here, Healthy Choice. Um, while traveling through California, I'll give you a little bit of a history lesson on, on Healthy Choice. Uh, Mike Harper, who was our then CEO back in the 80s at the time, suffered a mild heart attack. He made a full recovery. Um, he wanted to focus on healthy eating habits. And so began his search, his personal search, for foods that were, at the time, quote unquote, healthy. So at that time, it was low sodium and low fat. And, and uh, foods that we considered were good for heart health. And, and while his search proved pretty, uh, when his search proved pretty unsuccessful, uh, he took it upon himself to create the product himself, which is how Healthy Choice was born. Um, you know, it was good for you at the time. Um, but what's happened since the 80s is the definition of health is shifting tremendously, as we all know in this room. And healthy choice is no longer about low fat and low sodium products. It's moving away from that identity focused on diet and focused on, we've really done a full brand renovation and innovation effort that focuses on high quality food, modern recipes and food with purpose. Today Healthy Choice believes that healthy meals should be full of diverse ingredients like ancient whole grains like quinoa. I don't know why we say ancient whole grains, it's a little <laughs> quinoa. Um, <laughs> they come down from the mountains of quinoa. <laughs> Colorful, unique vegetables. <laughs> unique vegetables like peppers. Um, you may have heard of them. And lean proteins. But it's a very different product today than it was years ago. And so we've just recently launched this line of, of Healthy Choice Power Bowls that are made with a, com a combination of nutrient-dense vegetables, proteins, whole grains, catering to people living an active lifestyle. And the meals are inspired by Korean, Cuban, and Latin cuisines, and actually made in a bowl that is edible. It's a plant-based fiber instead of plastic. So it's very different than your father's Healthy Choice. Same thing with PAM non-aerosol. And this all gets to listening to the consumer. Um, some consumers, PAM has 98% penetration in the United States. It's, it's probably our, our, our highest penetrated brand. How many of you have a can of PAM in your cupboard? The majority. That's about 98%. Thank you. It's about 98%. I knew it was 98%. Um, but, a lot of folks nowadays, as we become more health conscious and more concerned about the environment, do not love the aerosol. So what have we done? Well, we've come out with a pump spray uh, for the traditional product that is, that is out now. And it's not, you know, it's, and it's a full array of oil. So it's coconut, it's, it's canola, it's vegetable. It's, it's more, and there's more coming down the pike too. It's olive oil, it's, it's others, uh, other flavors as well so that we give you the option. Again, the goal isn't to disenfranchise the core consumers who love the aerosol, but it is to make sure that we continue to diversify our, our, uh, our consumer base and continue to bring in new consumers to the fold. Um, same thing with Bertoli and P.F. Chang's. Many people are looking for food now with fewer ingredients and less artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives. So we've done just that with these brands. And, and overall, there are different drivers for different groups of people. It's not like, it's just like t-shirts. It's no one size fits all. And nowadays, you know, and we're, we're gonna talk about it a lot today. Um, and I know we're all living it, but we as marketing professionals you can't just, you know, years ago, I started, when I started 107 years ago, when this was analog megaphone, um, I, thank you. 
I want to thank my brother who laughed. Um, <laughs> no, but, it, you know, you could get one hit. I mean, you would get one hit on the Today Show, and bam, this, uh, a, a product was born. We did it years ago. I was on Pepsi. I, I worked at Pepsi for many years, and um, most of my career I've been doing consumer packaged goods. Uh, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years now. And at Pepsi, my CEO said, all you have to do is get Pepsi One, which is now since, I think it's Pepsi Max now, but Pepsi One, which was a zero-calorie drink, um, a la Coke Zero. Um, you get that on the, on the Rosie O'Donnell show, and you fulfilled our job. And he was, and we did it, and you know, and Pepsi One did fine. World doesn't work, the same thing with Tickle Me Elmo, right, and, and all these other brands. It doesn't work that way anymore. Media is so fragmented. We cannot just speak with one audience now and be like, well, that's it, we're done. Um, your consumers are diversified, um, your media is fragmented and diversified. We've got to figure out ways to tell our story to a variety of audiences and make sure that we continuously were aligned every step of the way on our narrative and making sure that we're speaking with people in a two-way dialogue in a way in which they wish, they wish to be spoken with, not at. And so, as consumer preferences in food change, as you'll see from up here, so do people's, so do their preferences for marketing and messaging. The world has changed drastically, and, and movement of consumers away from traditional media viewing and towards streamed online content continues to accelerate uh, more so ever before, and it's forced all of us, all of us to plot new strategies. Now, I will say, from a communication standpoint, we have been doing content and, and evolving content since the years, uh, since the days of Ivy Lee and Edward Bernays, the folks who are the fathers of public relations. But you know, as as traditional advertising has 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 uh, shifted, you know, content is king, as we all know. And a good idea comes from anywhere. And for us, you know, it is more important now than ever before that we continuously come up with content that's going to drive that's going to drive awareness, that's going to drive acceptance, that's going to drive advocacy, that's really going to, to and ultimately, drive sales. Uh, as growing forces of social media and over-the-top services, programmatic streaming, continues to exert themselves, particularly among the coveted millennials and Generation Z, fresh realities begin to emerge across the tech, media, and telecom spaces, and these people are not digesting content in the, in the traditional forms. Um, it's not to say that people aren't watching TV anymore or listening to radio or print, but as we all know, it's changed a heck of a lot. And you can't, you cannot do that, I think, certainly our brands can't do that, um, absent of a digital social initiative. In fact, for us right now, the way that we're gonna continue to support our brands is we're looking, we're evolving to a 70-30 split. So where in the past, it probably was shifted, where 70% went to traditional advertising and 30% was digital, it's gonna flip. And, and we're gonna be there pretty quickly because that's where our consumers are right now. And that's where they're going. So, so for us, attitudes towards advertising have changed. The factors that influence buying decisions today are shifting and will continue to do so. Interaction and engagement are taking on new forms as, cons as consumers take control of their own digital experience. Um, it's amazing what's gonna be happening with 5G. I I'm speaking uh, in September at, at, a, at a conference in New York and it's just, I was just looking at some of the statistics yesterday. It it's just, it's amazing how quickly things are moving and how exciting it makes it for us as marketing communicators and, and, uh, uh, and how it's daunting as well because you really have got, there's no rest for the weary um, because uh, you know, our brands are expecting it, our, our, uh, our colleagues are expecting it, our customers are expecting it, our consumers are expecting it, and, and you cannot, there's no resting on your laurels. Um, you've got to stay on top of it. Uh, in order to speak and connect with people, we need to know a lot about them, which is why data also is king right now. And, and we, can, we continue to put a tremendous amount, as all of you are, of our energy and data and knowing our consumers as best as we can so that we can create the type of messaging and how and when it's delivered across each brand. If you look at the next slide, this all ladders up to a number of shifts that we've made in our go-to-market approach. Uh, rather than looking at 
a singular consumer defined by demographics now, we're digging into the circumstances and the jobs to be done to solve consumers' everyday needs. For us now, we've adopted the jobs theory um, uh, initiative uh, or, or way of doing work now where each brand has a series of jobs that it does and consumers can hire or fire these brands based on those jobs. You'll see that um, we are really moving towards just a sole focus of reach and impressions, which, you know, for years in communications and public relations, you know, impressions has always been our major form of measurement. It's not going to cut it going forward. We can't just rely on impressions anymore. Um, advertising equivalencies were great 20 years ago, but it's not what, what our folks are expecting anymore. And frankly, if we want to fight to have those good ideas and to be at the table, we have to be front and center always. We've got to be coming up with the ideas and we've got to be focusing on engagement and advocacy. It's not just about impressions right now. It's about uh, gaining folks, uh, it's about engagement, it's about adoption, it's about advocacy so people can become brand ambassadors for you and speak from the rooftops about your brands. It's no longer about epic TV campaigns, as I said to you before. We still do do some TV advertising, but, but um, as I said before, it's going to be less, and we're going to a publisher mentality right now, which is what communications is kind of we've always thought from an editorial standpoint, looking at, at a year. When I was at Pepsi, where I was at Sierra Lee or, uh, or, um, or Hillshire, you know, you, it was at a time where you can do your advertising campaign in January, and then for 12 months, due to a, a strategically planned media schedule, you would have your home marketing uh, programs for the year. You'd have your, your TV advertising, your radio, your print. It doesn't work that way. I mean, we have to zig, we have to be able to zag, we have got to be, we have to be agile, we've got to be fast, we've got to be innovative, we've got to be smart, we've got to be outfoxing others. We've got to make sure that our brands are front and center and our brands are what people are looking for. There's a lot of, of uh, of responsibility here, and as we all know from what Uncle Ben said in, in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And so for us, it is we have to earn that seat at the table every day. So taking a publisher's mentality and mindset to leverage an ever-increasing number of media channels is exactly what we're doing. And we're moving away from big budget production uh, towards a more efficient way of making relevant content that's going to cut through, this, through the clutter. And, and get our messaging across so that we can uh, engage people and that we can make them advocates. Um, whether it's scrappy production val values or relying on influencers to be our voice, that's how we're doing it right now. And I, we're not alone. I, I believe that is the way that, that many are doing it right now, most. Uh, and in measurement, we're becoming far more, at, more agile by measuring programs in real time. Rather than via a comprehensive post-campaign marketing mix analysis, um, and by the way, the post-op after the post-op is what we focus on too. So it just, you know, I, I do a lot of, uh, and Dan does as well, we do a lot of judging of these, uh, of a lot of awards, whether it's, it's the PRSA awards or PR Week awards or the Holmes PR awards. Um, and it's so funny because everybody, you know, it's as if, you know, the job ends with your analysis. So, you know, you, 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 you know we begin with the end in mind. Uh, and then you, you, you go through your measurement and that's, that's where it, it begins and ends. Sometimes the program will go into a second year, but for the most part, it's, it, there's a beginning and an end. That's not how it goes anymore. For us, you know, we're going further. It's not just when that program ends or when we hand in that award uh, application, it's beyond. I mean, we want to have a continuous conversation and engagement with our consumers. And, and, and that is, that's how we do our job, right? And if we're not doing that, then, then someone else should be doing it. Um, because that's what the brands, the customers, and consumers expect and deserve. In measurement, as I said, we're going to continue to do that. And we're going to continue to look at, um, at, uh, at impressions, but, because it is what we have, but going much further. And what is nice about it is you'll see in our case studies that, that Dan and I will take you through shortly, um, the impact of some of the changes that we've made has been very, very strong. And, and more so, um, it's nice to see that we've moved the needle. Going to the next slide. So if we're able to be agile and we're able to zig and zag where we need to be and we, need to, and we can touch 
our consumers and connect with them in a, a powerful way, not only where they live, but where they hang out, we have to make sure that we accompany them, or at least are aware of every step of the journey. So as you look at this slide, you'll see the accompanying um, social media that kind of takes us through that discover, consider, purchase, um, uh, uh, prepare. prepare, enjoy, and, and advocate uh, slide. And basically, or endorse and share, uh, endorse or share bubble. But it really, for us, it's about being on that journey and making sure we are where they are. Today, consumers intercept messages in a variety of ways throughout their day. Uh, it's important that we are catering messages and vehicles to them when they are most receptive to receiving them. Um, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that if we have a great message, that we're able to deliver it in a way that's going to connect with them, in a way that's uh, going to reach them and have an impact and an effect on them. And we have a wealth of tactics at our disposal, but we always need to be mindful of where they come into play during the consumer journey. Uh, what tools are best for helping a consumer develop and discover our brands? What will motivate them to buy our brands? And where can they share their positive thoughts and become a true advocate after the meal is done? For us, it's not just about awareness. So in the past, with communications, we would, we would, well, we got awareness, we're done. Oh, no. We want awareness that's going to translate to repeat purchasing. That's going to translate to advocacy and endorsement. That's really the home run. You, you know, when I was at Pepsi years ago, it was very funny because I remember going to my boss once, and, you know, Pepsi is such a ubiquitous brand, was then, is now, you know, and, and you would come in and we'd have clips that we would send out to the whole organization. And, and if something said Pepsi, you'd include it in the clips. And my boss said, I don't care if they mention Pepsi. Everybody mentions Pepsi. I want to make sure that our key messaging is in there. I want to make sure these, that our messaging and our story is being told. And it was true then and it's true now. We just have to be more diligent about it right now. It's not just about which is why we have got to get away from, from impressions because it's, or advertising equivalents or, or column inches because it's not really effective it's, and it's not accurate. Um, moving on to our next slide. Before we get into our case studies, I'm going to share with you a highlights reel that Dan put together uh, that we produced over the past fiscal year that kind of gives you a, a, a little bit of a glimpse into some of the case studies that we'll be talking about shortly. So, Without further ado, if you You're going to see us continue to make progress as we get our new innovation out into the marketplace. Last night, for investors, we debuted a whole slate of new innovation. They will begin rolling out around June, July, August of this year, and that's just the beginning. something you can buy? A visit to the dining room by Marie Callender's. Jenny designed one of the rooms and proceeds benefit Habitat for Humanity. Chopped is teaming up with Marie Callender's Comforts from Home Project and Habitat for Humanity. You too can help families and vets build a place to call home. You have teamed up with P.F. Chang for the Chinese New Year, mm -hmm. and you're telling me that anyone can make these because they're pre-made and they're delicious. Things. They're wonderful, authentic, they gold flavors, and all the sauces are made from scratch, which is, it just, it, it feels good to know that. When I have my friends over for Chinese New Year, I prepare mainstream dishes with similar bold flavors and spices that my grandma would use. So the hunt's difference. Uh, we're talking about peeling tomatoes. Honestly, very straightforward process. I feel great about buying Hunt's tomatoes for my family, knowing that they're using flash steaming. So today we're going to be talking about some creative ways to get more vegetables into people's diets. And I've recently learned that Hunt's actually uses a flash steam process. You can't make great chili without tomatoes. I rock with Hunt's. We have a problem. Man, what are we gonna do? New episodes of The Walking Dead premiere Sunday nights at 9 on AMC. See if they have the nacho flavor. Brought to you by Slim Jim. Snap into a Slim Jim! I can't watch that movie 
in the theater with that pot. I have to have popcorn with uh, peanut M&Ms in it. Just a little bit of salt and throw in some uh, little pieces of chocolate. I'm good to go. You can make mealtime fun too. Star Wars themed Kick Cuisine meals now available in stores. <laughs> Bring the frosty fun of Arendelle to life with the limited edition Kick Cuisine meals oh. featuring your favorite Disney Frozen characters. There's nothing like being on the set of a live musical production, all happening in real time. And speaking of real, Ready Whip has always been made with real cream. This year there is a national crisis. We're running out of Ready Whip. A new shipment arrived this morning, but when they're all sold out, guess what? That is it. No more Ready Whip. No more Ready Whip. It actually, it drove sales, and we did not plan it, of course. There was an unfortunate uh, plant explosion that, uh, that uh, hurt the, uh, the supply of nitrous oxide. Um, uh, so we were, we've got enough Ready Whip right now. In fact, for those of you who are interested, we're coming out with coconut and almond milk Ready Whip in the next year. So uh, be on the lookout for that. It's talking about staying on trend. All right, Marie Callender's real quick, because I know that we're getting pressed on time. It started in the early 1940s. It was a, a well-known comfort food and pie and restaurant company on the West Coast. Um, while both comfort food and pie are on trend, as we all know, younger consumers are looking for it from niche companies and restaurants like Sweet Mandy Bees here in Chicago or Bang Bang or Who's Your Mama Pies instead of the larger brands like Marie Callender's. So for us, the challenge that we have is how do you make people think about the brand differently and enter the dining room by Marie Callender's, uh, a place for consumers to either experience the brand for the first time or be reintroduced to it and truly contemporize the brand. And we built it on insights that we knew that people wanted to savor the holiday season with their family and friends. Um, but we all know that in New York, you know, comfortable space is not easy to come by. In fact, the average size of an apartment in New York is 934 square feet, which is 8% less than it was 10 years ago. Um, and, and right now, if people are going to host holiday parties or do food preparation, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So uh, working with our great partners at Edelman, we came up with the Marie Callender Dining Room uh, Initiative, which was to create a comfortable space for those in New York, uh, including travelers, visitors, to savor the, the season with family and friends. And for one week, we brought New Yorkers uh, the dining room space they crave with the holiday food they, they love. Uh, we had three celebrities designing dining rooms for people to reserve host reserve to host holiday gatherings. And we also, uh, we did well by doing good by also making a major donation to Habitat for Humanity, which you just heard in the video. And it really, it was fantastic. In fact, the room sold out in within three hours, uh, the first few hours of the reservation system being open. And... Um, and purchase intent, which is more important, improved greatly uh, with visitors. In fact, uh, we had about 400 influencers in that one week visit the dining room at the opening party. They talked about it on social media. Uh, we uh, paid behind it and, and elevated it and amplified it in a big way. And um, anything you want to add before we go to the video? No, I think the video, just in the interest of time, will tell a really nice story. But I think this was a, you know, a really nice way to contemporize the brand for an audience that might not otherwise be exposed to it. So let's take a closer look. We are at The Dining Room by Marie Callender. We turned this lofted area into an amazing dining room. In New York City, apartments are small, space is limited, and people want to have these holiday parties, but they don't have the space or the bandwidth, honestly, to do it, to make a three-course meal that tastes and looks this good. It 
It's been such amazing response. We have a wait list now. People are banging on the doors trying to get into this dining room by Marie Callender. We're doing something called The Dining Room by Marie mm -hmm. Callender's. It's here in New York City. It's an opportunity for people who don't have enough space, mm -hmm. which is very common in the mm -hmm. city, to entertain and get together with their friends and family. Something you can buy? A visit to The Dining Room by Marie Callender's. Jenny designed one of the rooms and proceeds benefit Habitat for Humanity. This is the greatest it's deal amazing. in dining. I mean, if you think about it, $100. You and up to 16 guests. That's parking. Yeah. That's what you pay in parking. New York. Yeah. For one car. Um, Stacey London has done one, Daphne Oz, and myself. And you're going to be receiving a three-course comfort food meal That's from Marie Callender. That's amazing. And that is unbelievable. Great. And they make great pot pies, by the way. <laughs> so you're doing something good and you're getting a free meal. Y'all, yeah. we all live in apartments, many of us. Uh -huh. We've got to do this. We should do it. Let's do it. great thing here is that everyone outside of New York City around the country can see these great spaces, can see the great food that we're serving, and take little pieces maybe for their dinner parties or their um, holiday parties and really savor the season. Free Marie calendars and a, and a ConAgra VIP package for anyone who could tell me the first and last name of Jenny Garth's character on 90210. Yes. You are correct. Taylor. Give it to Amy. All right. All right, Amy. Okay. Email me. Let's hear for Amy, everybody. She's working hard. <laughs> Kelly Taylor, well done. So from Marie Callender to Slim Jim. So the Slim Jim consumer, the challenge here is that this is a male who does not consume the traditional media outlet. So how do we reach this guy where he is? Well, Twitter is a great place to do that. And to amplify our Settle the Beef campaign, we invited them to settle the beef. Now, we know there are three pillars that this guy really gets excited about, competition, camaraderie, and comedy. So let's bring a comedian, let's bring an athlete, and let's bring a video gamer onto Twitter and allow people to literally settle the beef with these guys. So we had Jeff Ross from Comedy Central, we had Isaiah Thomas of the Boston Celtics, and we had Nade Shot, who I didn't know much about beforehand, but he has a million plus followers on Twitter. So each of these individuals hosted an hour-long Twitter party, and we had participants in the hundreds, but we really creates this ripple effect of all these impressions. We got up over 150 million impressions for the campaign because of the power of every time Nate Shot is sending out something slash tag or a hashtag Slim Jim, it's going out to his potential audience of a million followers. So not only were the Twitter parties exciting, but it gave us a reason to hit some of these non-traditional media outlets with a story. So we were able to get SportsIllustrated.com to talk to Isaiah Thomas and Up Rocks and uh, the Made Man podcast talk to Jeff Ross. So really a great example of taking a, a brand where the consumer is not in your uh, traditional spaces and bringing it to life. When we moved to Hunts, um, this was an opportunity for us to take a very difficult message, our flash team point of difference, and bring it to life in a personal way uh, for our influencer partners. Influencers now. Well, let's help Flash Team. Sure. Just tell them what Flash Team is. It's a process that we do. It's organic. It's authentic. Um, most canned tomatoes use lye, so they use chemicals. So it's a point of difference that we've really never talked about. And Hunts is a century-old brand. So yeah. So. When we work with blogger partners now, what we really want to do to distinguish ourselves from the pack is give them a unique, memorable experience, and that really fuels their content engine for the time that they're partnering with us. In this case, it was over six months. So we brought them all to New York City, we showed them the Flash Team point of difference, and then we cooked them a four-course meal uh, that featured hunts throughout every step of the, uh, the dinner. So uh, let's show you some highlights of that. And what's nice about this highlights reel is that uh, it captured the event and then allowed us to broadcast it out to a million plus viewers on Facebook. So not only are you creating a nice experience for uh, these seven blogger attendees, but you're syndicating it to a much wider audience. Hey everybody. Hey guys, feel free to come on in close. So the hunt's difference. Uh, we're talking about peeling tomatoes. Honestly, very straightforward process. So this is very reminiscent of the flesh steaming process. As we saw, the water got in between the skin and the tomato, and now it's just really that easy. Honestly, before today's event, I really felt like probably all canned tomatoes were prepared the same way. I had no idea that Hunts took the time to steam peel their tomatoes. 
I feel great about buying Hunt's tomatoes for my family, knowing that they're using flash steaming. Everything's Hunt's, yeah. I like cooking with tomatoes all year round. It's one of the beauties of using the Hunt's cans. The meal was amazing. It was like we were sitting in a four-star restaurant. Everything was just phenomenal. Even the marinara sauce had more of a fresh taste to it. And I loved how versatile he made the tomatoes, how he used it in every single dish from the appetizer to the cheese plate at the end. I really love this next case study for Hebrew National and kudos to our partners from Edelman for being the drivers behind this idea. National Hot Dog Week, another one of those you know, PR classics of every food and every beverage has a national something day. Well, we're in a crowded space. It's the middle of July. How do we break through? Well, we came up with a very unique idea here to hit some traditional media outlets and that was to create a 1700 carat hot dog loaded with $200 worth of topping, aged balsamic and mushrooms and even gold dust on top of it also with the challenge of trying to keep it a kosher recipe, which was not easy to do. Um, but we went the extra mile to not only create this dog, but then cater it and hand deliver it to the media outlets that we targeted. So we were able to get on the Today Show and hit Time Magazine, Food and Wine, Fox News. And what I really like about this is I didn't feel like it was a stunt for stunt's sake. It tied back to our premium point of difference and our message that Hebrew National is a, a premium hot dog kind of above the category. So what hot dog could be more premium and better suited to pull off $200 worth of toppings. We generated 21 million media impressions from this activation, and again, I think it was a really nice way to do something uh, a little stunty, but also staying true to who we are and the message we were trying to get across. And finally, there's good old Orville Redenbacher, a brand that, uh, you know, again, has been around for years. So how do we keep this brand contemporary and also bring to life a program that is efficient? Now, one of the nice things with the activations we did at Sundance Film Festival and the Grammy Awards, um, we sponsored lounges and gave celebrities an opportunity to come in and try our product. That gives us the opportunity to get a wealth of celebrity content out of their presence in this lounge. So rather going out and striking 25 different celebrity endorsement deals, which would blow our budget and, and force us to, you know, um, say goodbye to the rest of the campaign for Orville, we were able to get all these celebrities through one agreement with Sundance and one agreement with the Grammys. So you've got uh, Stevie Nicks, you've got, uh, you saw Gina Davis and Benjamin Bratt in the, uh, the thing earlier, Holly Hunter, all these people coming And contemporary in. folks, Lumineers, Cage the Elephant, yes. John Hamm. So it, you were not only embracing the Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty crowd, but then also the, the, the Lumineers and, and your Millennials and, and your, your Gen Zs. Something for everybody there. So. This became great social content for us. It gave us a reason to go out to entertainment media. Um, you know, really kind of an all-encompassing one-stop shop for us to be able to associate ourselves with these major awards and festivals. So we'll wrap it up. John, I'll give it back to you to kind of share our conclusions. Thanks, Dan. Now, uh, hopefully across all, you've seen uh, some consistent themes and ones that can maybe apply to your business. Uh, we'd like to think that our learnings could help others. Um, think about how your brand or company may appeal to new consumers. It's truly the only way to grow your business. Um, as we said before, you've got to stay contemporary and you've got to not only be, you've got to be 10 steps ahead of the consumer. It's not just about the consumer today, it's the consumer in five years, the consumer in 10 years. Um, develop a brand narrative steeped in insights. Uh, this has led us to market our brands not just to a demographic, but to a consumer looking to address a very real daily struggle. Again, it's that jobs that we talked about. Our consumers hire us. And like, like an employee, if we're not living up to that expectation, we're going to get fired. So we've got to make sure that we're on top of that and we're constantly providing them understanding what their needs and struggles are and making sure that we're providing uh, regular solutions for them. And again, being every step of the way uh, with them on that journey. Uh, consider more creative tactics to bring the narrative to life. There are so many new things that we can do and, and that we have to keep doing. I think that there are so many channels out there to tell your story and creative ways to bring stories to life. We are only as good as the content that we have. We're only as good as the brands that we have, and then we're only as good as the story that we tell. So for us, um, it's just critical that we stay on top of the best vehicles to reach people in a very positive way and powerful way. And like I said before, not only where they live, but more importantly, where they hang out. Um, and measure and adjust in real time. It's new for us in, in, in communications and public relations, but it's making all the difference. Uh, you know, the days of Monday morning quarterbacking are long over, um, and, and now we can react in the moment and make changes when appropriate. Next slide. That's it. And that concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much for allowing us to present to you today. Thank you.